Welcome everyone to an excerpt of my introductory lecture on Hegel, which is part of my German idealism course. So I'd like to give everyone a bit of an insight into what the course is like, if you'd still want to uh, enroll, for example, as a student who'd just maybe prefer to study on your own time. That enrollment is still open just by following the link down below. And we'll just get into a bit of Hegel for about 10-15 minutes. As I said, this is part of the lecture course. So with no further ado, we now move into Hegel. First, remembering Hegel. We have arrived at the first pinnacle of this not yet fully bethought thought path that is still open. Hegel himself stresses that his philosophy is a continuation of the Kantian project. We can give here only hints at some of the results of this completion, which is at once a beginning. We must, however, refrain vigorously from taking any of these so-called results as a toolbox with which we can arbitrarily operate in the world. For absolute knowledge, abstracts, results are empty. Only the technical, practical world access, the instrumental rationality, wants and needs abstract results, tools with which it can operate arbitrarily. Thinking, however, needs to think through the inherent movement of what is to be thought and to be articulated. Anything else would mean to presuppose the result. One cannot claim to provide in such a short amount of time the full scope of the thinking involved and evolving. This final lecture is an invitation to read and think through these texts for yourselves. These lectures as such, cannot provide really path marks along the way, but they can hint at the paths that are still open. For even if it is the case, as some have claimed, that metaphysics or philosophy find their fulfillment and completion in Hegel, this does not mean that it just ends or even demises here. The Greek principle of peras, limit, according to Aristotle, is what allows something to be determined. It is the limit of philosophy where it begins again anew, through recollecting itself, through innering, erinnerung, through its Gedächtnis, through its profound recollection of itself. Still, one has to stride through thinking on one's own, alone. Results must not be pressed into neat propositions, which can easily be conflated with thought. We must leave behind representation. As Hegel himself says, beim Denken muss einem Hören und Sehen vergehen. In thinking, one has to lose one's senses of hearing and eyesight. In the preface to the first edition of the Wissenschaftslogik, Hegel's Magnum Opus, the science of logic, so-called in English, Hegel points out that the metaphysics of what we today refer to as early modern times no longer, and Hegel says this about his time, they no longer speak to us today. That would be Spinoza, Leibniz, Christian Wolff. Questions about the immateriality of the soul, the mechanics of the universe, the existence of God, etc., are perhaps of historical interest, and they are still today, of course, because what's flourishing are the so-called uh, departments of the history of philosophy, which can be neatly pushed away. It's just, you know, these quirky, funny, weird positions from hundreds of years ago, which we don't really have to take seriously. So those questions, you know, they might be of, and Hegel says this 200 years ago, they might be of historical interest and Perhaps they serve the purpose to be edifying. As Hegel says in the Phenomenology of Spirit, however, philosophy must make sure not to be edifying. The loss of metaphysics, which Hegel here in The Science of Logic explicitly addresses, is the same loss we still suffer through. The loss of a certain metaphysics is at once the call for the need of the birth of a renewed one, or 
the renewed one in the sense of a possibility and necessity of a new world. Metaphysics is for Hegel the sanctum, the sanctuary, das Allerheiligste, this is a quote, das Allerheiligste in the body of a people. Through Kant's critical philosophy, however, speculative thought has been curbed, and all of speculative thinking is now deemed to lead to Hirngespinste, phantasms of the brain. Hegel sees in logic for speculative thought its last bastion, because here reason and the understanding in unison can articulate Wirklichkeit, actuality, without sterilizing or homogenizing the world. Quote from Hegel, and it's my translation. The understanding determines and holds on to determinations. Reason, however, is negative and dialectical because reason dissolves the determinations of the understanding into nothing. It is positive because reason generates the universal and captures the particular within the universal. End of quote. Kant holds the understanding higher than reason. In fact, Kant tames reason to make room for faith and to bind the understanding and its logical form, the I think again, to sensibility, even if only schematically. Kant also sets up a system of principles, principle suppositions in order to establish again a unity between being and thought. How can thinking rise again to speculative thought, unifying opposites within itself without producing phantasms? What must reason allow for in order to suspend with its inherent antinomies? Hegelian dialectics. We need not dwell too long on the misconception that Hegelian dialectics is the movement supposedly from thesis to antithesis to synthesis. There is no schema of proper dialectics, just as there is no schema of thinking in its highest form at all. So whenever you hear someone say, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis in Hegel, you can uh, comfortably move along and disregard anything they have to say. So there is no schema of dialectics. Just there is, there is no schema of thinking. Think, thinking thinks itself. And Fichte, however, presents precisely this dialectical schema, and this is often conflated with Hegel. Hegel criticizes Fichte's abstraction of dialectics, which turns thinking into something superficial and formalistic. Hegel's thinking, his true dialectics, do not isolate the steps of mediation, the Vermittlungsschritte, which then would aim towards something. So there is no uh, horizon, there's no predetermined or presupposed horizon, there's no telos that's given towards which the dialectic supposedly strives. One cannot see the future with dialectics as perhaps Karl Marx may have believed. That would be a superficial teleology. There is progression in Hegelian dialectics, but not towards a predetermined end. There is neither a schema, nor are there any laws that we could draw from it of proper dialectics or thinking, which could be corroborated in a table or as a set of principles to be applied arbitrarily whenever we feel like it. Hegel's dialectics is best thought of as the continuous process of mediation through negativity. The main difference between Hegel and his predecessors Kant and Fichte is that Hegelian logic considers or looks at the logical moments of thinking, principles in this sense, however, in themselves. That is to say, these logical moments have content of their own and then show themselves to be principles, but only within the movement and the imminence of the thought. They cannot be drawn out. They cannot be separated from and then arbitrarily uh, juxtapositioned, etc., with other principles. That is to say, these logical moments have content of their own. There is a unity of form and matter. Their content thus does not come from outside, but springs or originates from the self-movement of logical form, which is neither, rigid, uh, neither a rigid shell nor a pure principle as is still the case with Kant. The logical form is moving itself, and the Wissenschaftslogik, the science of logic, is the text which shows this very self-movement. What was lacking in Kant is what Hegel is trying to achieve, and already in his early lectures in Jena, by the way. 
the self-development of the categories out of themselves. Kant's transcendental logic projects the categories of formal logic, unity, reality, substance, possibility, onto objects of appearance and experience, but transcendental logic at the same time is not able to reel in, to bring in its own presuppositions. Formal logic is a skeleton. It is nothing organic and it does not move itself. Yet Hegel maintains the Kantian distinction between the understanding and reason. This is what he maintains, this is what he keeps. Those are not faculties, however. There is here no dynamis, as it were. A faculty implies a dynamis, um, a potentiality which is then actualized. The understanding and reason, der Verstand und die Vernunft, do not actualize anything. Instead, they are moment, they are themselves moments, logical moments of thinking. They are subjective, objective determinations relating to subject and object. The understanding is what fixates the general as opposed to the particular or the singular. Thinking must begin as such. It must make an inception by holding tight to an abstract universal, for example, pure being, as we shall see. The understanding, which is not a faculty, is then the moment of thinking that constitutes the persisting of things, or their wanting to persist. Reason, on the other hand, seeks the particular in the universal and dissolves into nothing the determinations of the understanding. As soon as something establishes itself and wants to hold on to itself, establish, is, establish its firm identity and difference to something other, it is the understanding through representation which tries to maintain the firmness of something as something. Spinoza's dictum, omnis determinatio est negatio, every determination is a negation, is of course in the background here in Hegel. That is to say, what something is in its actuality, in its determinacy, is only possible to be found or to be established through negation. That means through reason, but also through the understanding. So the understanding does have a right to determine something as itself, and only through this determination it is that reason comes in and must take over and must allow for neg negative dialectics to take its course. That is to say, what something is in its actuality in its determination is only possible through negation. Posi positivism, but, in, but together with the understanding. Positivism, which knows only the positive, but no negation, hence can also only represent sterile states. As you know, you know it's very often we speak of, a, I mean, I'm in this kind of a state and this is in that kind of a state, and that's positivism. That's positivistic, it's just positings. Um, something that's given, a state is given. But it cannot at all, positivism, articulate the living actuality of something. The fullest move of nature, for example, it just can um, determine a certain state of nature. Let's say uh, an ideal amount of species that supposedly is uh, to be uh, available at all times or an ideal climate that is supposedly the ideal climate for all times everywhere. Anyway, that's a state in which something is supposed to be in. It's actually a sterilization, a deadening of the world. One would have to wonder where the number zero factors into this here. Now, something is determined. So, here, the fullest, most alive way of articulating what is, is achieved in or through the negation of the negation which is a relation with itself and which, is, and which cannot be posited. Something is determined as what it is fully thanks to the understanding, yes, but also thanks to the negation against something other, preserving itself, however, and elevating itself to itself through the other. And this is an exemplary of sublation of Aufhebung. Hegel's notion of Aufhebung should be clarified here. Usually this word is translated as sublation, but it can also mean cancelling, preserving, concealing, sheltering, or lifting up. Aufhebung, sublation for now, characterizes the self-movement of dialectical thinking. There are three meanings of sublation. First, the negation of supposed self-reliance of category. 
for example, something as a category. This, however, does not mean that through this negation, the category, for example, something, is totally destroyed. For second, sublation also means to preserve at the same time. And finally, third, the category is through the simultaneous negation and preserving lifted higher. And more to the point, the abstract, and we are always ready with the abstract in the beginning, but then we move to the concrete from Latin, as Max Gottschlich always points out, from Latin concrescere, um, which means to grow together. So the concrete is that which has grown together, has been mediated. Identity and difference, for example, are concepts of so-called concepts, words, notions of the understanding from Verstand. The understanding wants to uphold clear-cut identity and pure difference. It in the moment that something constitutes itself as something which shows itself is that something is something not only in clear opposition to another, but is such necessarily also related to the other, identical with it. The understanding can only see clear-cut difference or identity because the understanding cannot allow for contradiction. As the understanding holds on too tight to something, it begins to vanish, to lose itself. Even just saying I or I am is already an expression of contradiction. I can only say I when I myself relate to myself. When I relate myself to myself, sorry, there is here a contraposition. The understanding and reason, however, do not stand next to each other or oppose each other. Reason must step in and allow for the vanishing of something. But this is not a triumph of reason over the understanding, as it were. Without the achievement of the understanding of holding tight to something, no categories would come about. Thus, differences or distinctions which the understanding qua logical potency makes must be taken seriously. Dialectical, um, dialectical movement, if you like, and remember reason is dialectical and negative, only arises when distinctions are taken seriously, but then are also let go. Reason cannot be without the understanding and vice versa. Yet where the understanding gets stuck is where reason must step in and allow for dialectical contraposition, and hence the logic can progress. Take the example, the rose is red. In formal terms, this states A is B. Yet here, precisely through the copula is, a contradiction shows itself. We must understand Widerspruch, contradiction, as that which is contrapositioned in one, which is an echo of Heraclitus, hen panta enai. So a contradiction does not mean it's wrong. A contradictio means it's contrapositioned or counterpositioned in one. To say that the rose is a rose, that A is A, is but a tautology of no significance. Only through the contradiction, through placing into one what is contraposition, subject and predicate, through the copula is, does the proposition have or gain significance. Contradiction then is not nonsense or similar, as it may be understood in common parlance. Instead, again, contradiction addresses that which is contrapositioned in one and which as such is placed into one but is placed so there's an activity it's not just a state it's an activity the rose is red is not a given state the rose is red is itself the dialog the dialectical dialogical movement of the world unfolding and us responding to it in such a way if we just see states and everything is just given and everything is split up and quantified etc etc but here we begin to see the living syllogism it's alive, it's organic. The syllogism is not a method, but it's living. It's breathing. We breathe the syllogism. When we speak of Hegel's dialectics, we could assume that we speak of his kind of thinking. Yet there are no kinds or types of thinking. Thinking itself is the general or universal as such. Thus, even to speak of the Kantian revolutions of thought, as I have done before, is perhaps already saying too much. I will not give here an overview, hence, over the supposed method of Hegelian dialectics. Instead, what I've done so far is to give some deliberations here, which are invitations to let oneself into this thinking, into thinking itself. As soon as thinking begins, 
it begins to think in terms of self-differentiation and self-identification of counter-positioning into one, etc. For as soon as we begin to interpret thinking, well, for as soon as we do so, which is what very often now happens, this can either be through brain scans um, or if just by looking at the methodology of a certain thinker, etc., um, we actually begin to interpret, understand thinking in technical, practical terms. We then look for the methods or the principles for tables and techniques, which can be easily applied and reapplied. It is much more difficult, but also infinitely simpler, just to think for oneself, just to let thinking think without association with something else. Oh, this reminds me of this, this reminds me of that. Remember, Khan is the king of the Enlightenment, for he calls for an end to dogmatic thinking. The rasterization of thinking. Right? Prevalent today is but a lapse back behind the revolution of the Enlightenment. Everything that is of spirit is thinking. This is the insight of Descartes already. There is nothing besides thinking for us humans. We are the living, breathing idea. We are the living concept, the begriff, with the, the begriff, the begreif, no? the concept that conceptualizes, the concept that grasps, that's what concept means. That is to say, insofar as we are, we are the relationship to and of the world which interprets itself. This is who the human being is. For Hegel, it is thinking itself that lays itself out, that interprets itself itself is important not interpreting from outside but self-interpretation as in thinking not looking at it from the outside and seeing oh here he's doing this and this is a and then this is b no you have to go into the thought and then it's self-interpreting without a given telos but a telos that imminently arises so the idea is not given in, in the beginning but arises necessarily as a peras a limit which we'll get later imminently and necessarily so. So there's a system of unities of relationships here to the world and to the self. To consider hierarchies, for example, between the imagination or representation and speculative thinking would also be superficial. Representation is similar to feeling. The way we think, in quotation marks, that means self-interpret in our everyday lives is through representing, representation. Representation is not a type or a kind of thinking, however, but is a certain self-interpretation of thinking. Put differently, thinking is a universal that particularizes itself also as representation. So what we may consider as types of thinking only in a superficial way, which sometimes happens, they are indeed moments of thinking's self-reference and self-interpretation. And Hegel develops a cosmos of thinking where it can't builds a cathedral. Hegel does not say that there is not to be any perceiving consciousness, which gives rise to representation. One needs to have been striding through perception, but one ought not to stop there. Perhaps with some caution, one can speak of levels, Stufen, of thinking's self-interpretation. Furthermore, technology or technique should remain a means and not um, and not become an end in itself, as it does for formal logic, as it does for positivism. If we begin to look for techniques of thinking, we alienate ourselves from ourselves, precisely because we are the living concept, the idea that knows itself. Yet no one is ever himself immediately. The human being is, as so on politicon, as a public being, always only transparent or accessible to himself via the other. Yet precisely here, there is also a threat, which Marx, of course, saw quite clearly and carved out, namely the threat of alienation. Alienation is, however, not just a mere threat, but in fact a necessity. For example, today we tend to self-interpret ourselves as computers. Our brains are just calculating machines and Artificial intelligence can calculate so much better, so you know, we just can we just give up and and lean back because these machines are so much better. And this happens by isolating, which means already represent representing the brain, 
as a computer, etc. Which is an incredible <laughs> level of abstraction, but one that leads absolutely nowhere. So still to anyone who still thinks, of course, you know, uh, what becomes apparent is precisely that this is still just an act of self-interpretation through the other, namely through the product of the computer, which is our product. We come towards ourselves from outside and forget that we are an I. To be torn is Im imminent. To be torn is imminent in human consciousness. Torn like a sock, an old sock, as Hegel says, ein alter Strumpf. But it is decisive that we can still see through these alienations and through them come back to ourselves and in this way sublate alienation. But alienation remains necessary. Logic and thinking must therefore again and again be appropriated. They are not simply given. Philosophy itself must be appropriated again and again and is not simply given, as in the, you know, the neat history of philosophy. Here we have this ism, then you have this period, and it's all just very interesting but completely irrelevant to us. That's not appropriation. That's alienation. That's alienation to being in contact with what is arbitrary and meaningless. It's always an act of self-interpretation, however. So, the task is again and again, so that we do not alienate ourselves from ourselves completely, and so much that we consider ourselves to be our own products, for example, computers. What we forget here is the negation of the negation. We need to lose ourselves, yes, but also negate this loss and return to ourselves in this manner. Through this death, we need to strive and maintain our strength. And to quote Master Eckhart, who puts it beautifully, the truth of the one philosophy, why do you go out in order to return home?